Hi, I'm Allison Ashley Cook. I'm a professor at Duke, and today I'm going to talk to you about what we've learned so far about genetics of Curie and what we hope to learn moving forward. So for this audience, I probably don't have to review all the symptoms and background about what Curie is, but we know that most of the symptoms are neurologic in nature. It requires an imaging study to get an accurate diagnosis. And the prevalence, we believe, is about 1% in the general population. We also know that if we look at adults who have Curie malformation, that there tend to be many more women who are affected compared with men. And this is different from when we look at the pediatric population, where we tend to see similar numbers of affected girls and boys. So why is studying genetics important? Well, if we can find the genes that contribute to risk for a curie, it will help us understand the mechanisms that lead to curie. It will also help us develop genetic tests, which will improve the accuracy and the speed at which people will receive a diagnosis. But ultimately, the real reason we do this is we hope it will help us develop new treatments and therapies so that we get the right treatment to the right patient. So how do we know genetics is important for a cure? The first is just simply that it runs in families. So if we look in the general population, any individual has about 1% risk. But if we look within families of someone who has Curie malformation, their relatives have about a 12 to 20% risk for Curie. So that's elevated over the general population. We also know when we look at identical twins and triplets, that they tend to be much more similar when it comes to Curie. And Curie often co-occurs with a number of other conditions, which we know are genetic, such as the Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome and Marfan Syndrome. And in many cases, we already know the genes for those other conditions. Several years ago, there was a really important family study that identified some of the first chromosomal regions that might contain a Curie gene. But just as important, if not more so, was that that study showed that the shape of our skull, particularly the posterior fossa region, which contains our cerebellum, that the shape and the size was heritable. So again, suggesting that genes are important. And then finally, many of you may already know this, but Cavalier King Charles Spaniels have a genetic predisposition for a Curie-like uh, symptoms. And so because we share a lot of our genome with other animals, this also suggests that genes are important. But finding the genes for Curie malformation has not been very easy for a number of different reasons. First, the presentation of symptoms that each individual experiences can be quite different person to person. And so that may be anything from just the symptom presentations, whether you have tingling in the hands or not, whether there are co-occurring other conditions such as Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, and also even the amount of cerebellar tonsil herniation. There's also some variability when it comes to the age of onset of Curie. As I mentioned earlier, 
if you look in the pediatric population, there are about equal numbers of boys and girls who are affected. But if you look after puberty, particularly in the adult population, women are much more affected than men. And then finally, we also know that the surgical approaches have varying degrees of success in different individuals. So for example, not all patients have complete resolution of their symptoms, such as their headaches and the tingling after the decompression surgery. And so we think that all these differences that the patients are experiencing is telling us something about genetics. So because we see this variability amongst individuals, we think that probably is also telling us that there are different mechanisms that lead to curing malformation. So I'm only going to cover a couple of them today because these are the ones that we've primarily focused on from a genetics perspective. The first is what we'll call cranial constriction. And this is where we believe that Curie arises from a smaller skull, so an underdeveloped occipital bone. And so this normal sized brain is being kind of squished in a too small skull. And so that's kind of the cranial constriction mechanism. I will also refer to it as connective tissue disorder negative. So we think that this is bony in origin and not connective tissue necessarily. The other mechanism is cranial settling. So in this mechanism, what we think is that the skull size and shape is appropriate and normal. And what's really happening is where the skull sort of meets the spine, that the cervical spine, that there's some instability. And that may actually be due to the connective tissue. So this particular mechanism is often referred to as cranial settling or also connective tissue disorder positive. And importantly, there's more and more studies coming to light that suggest that this connection between connective tissue disorders and Curie is really important and also identifying kind of a unique subset of patients. So how do we use this information to help us find the genes? And more specifically, from a genetics perspective, how do we find the genes? The most simple description of what we do really is just to look at regions of our genome that are shared by people who have Chiari and not shared with people who do not have Chiari. So there are two primary approaches that have been used in Chiari, and so I'll discuss each of those briefly. So the first is an association study, which really is kind of a 10,000 foot view of our genome. So rather than telling us exactly what gene and where it is, it sort of gives us you know, a general idea where the genes may be. And so a good way to maybe think about this is if you're driving down the highway, you'll see mile markers, and those mile markers will tell you how far you are to the next city and where you need to go. And so similarly, 
we have kind of markers in our genome that are not necessarily indicative of a particular condition, but really just sort of tell us this is the area on chromosome 1 or chromosome 10, etc. So this approach really just helps us kind of narrow where we're looking. The other approach, which is being used more currently, is what's called sequencing. And so sequencing is a much closer view of our genomes. In fact, we're looking at every A, C, T, G. So rather than just sort of having a general idea where we're looking, we're actually looking at every single place. So, you know, it, it's a lot more difficult to do sequencing, but it also gives us a great deal more precision. And so you can do this either across the whole genome, or you can focus on specific genes, or even in a lot of cases, just look at the regions of the genome that code for proteins, like the exonic region. And so now that you know the two major approaches that we use, what have we learned? Well, our group about 10 years ago performed an association study and among our connective tissue disorder negative, so the cranial constriction families, we found two regions of the genome that looked like they would contain Chiari genes. And so we used the association to narrow us to those regions. And then we followed that up by sequencing in those regions. And what we found were two growth and differentiation factors called GDF3 and GDF6, where we actually did find changes among individuals who had Chiari malformation. And the reason we were so excited by this was because both those genes had also been associated with Klippel-Feil syndrome, which is another condition that tends to co-occur with Chiari. And that same year, a Spanish group looked closely at a handful of genes that they had prioritized. They took an association approach, and they focused on genes that were expressed during development and were important for bone and connective tissue growth. And so they ended up finding three genes which appeared to be important. The first being the CDX1 gene, which is expressed in the hindbrain, which is where our cerebellum develops. And importantly, this gene also seems to regulate other genes and helps them turn on and off. They also found an association with this ethyl T1 gene, which is an important growth factor gene, and it interacts with another gene I'll tell you about in a few slides called VEGF. And then finally, this third gene that they found is ALDH1A2. And that gene was really interesting because it regulates retinoic acid. And there have been reports in the literature of retinoic acid exposure leading to the development of Chiari. A more recent study that also focused on the cranial constriction mechanism, this Musoff et al. study, performed exome sequencing, so the newer technology, and they sequenced the parts of the genes which code for the protein. 
and they studied a bunch of Russian families. At the end of the day, they couldn't really tell which genes were the important ones, but they did prioritize two genes, one of which is involved in muscle function as well as joints, and then a second gene, which is involved in mitochondrial function. And so mitochondria are the organelles in our cell that drive the energy production that our cells need. So both of those were really interesting candidates. So now I'm gonna focus on the cranial celling mechanism or the connective tissue disorder positive families. And thus far, no studies have focused just specifically on those families, but one of the things that a fairly recent study had shown was that about 12% of Curie patients also had evidence for a connective tissue disorder. And many of you in the clinic may have been asked to complete a Biden scale, which looks at hyperextensibility. And anecdotally, we know that some individuals with Chiari have also been diagnosed with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. And as I mentioned earlier, there are genes that we already know are important for Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. So the extent to which those genes contribute to Chiari is currently unknown, although we have had a recent study shed a little bit of light on that. And so more recently, just this past year, uh, there was a study by Sadler and colleagues, and this was the first study to focus really on the pediatric population. There were some adult onset cases that they looked at as well, but what they found were these two genes called CDH8 and CDH3. And they are part of a gene family that's important for altering the structure of our chromosomes so that genes can be turned on and turned off. It's called chromatin remodeling. And so the majority of patients with Curie that had changes in those genes were pediatric cases. And interestingly, compared with the cranial constriction that I was telling you about, where there's kind of at least part of the skull is too small, in these patients, the skull was actually large. So these patients had a large head circumference. And so another study in concert with Conquer Curie and my group, we performed targeted sequencing, exome sequencing, so the protein coding regions of a subset of genes uh, in adult females with PRA malformation. And some of the genes we prioritized were from the earlier Urbizu study that I had mentioned, as well as some of the Ehlers-Danlos genes. And so interestingly, what we found was a number of genes that encode collagens were associated in or Curie individuals. And so collagens are important components of connective tissue and skin and bones. And we found that nearly half of the Curie patients that we studied had a genetic variant in one of those genes. We also found evidence for that FLT1 gene that I had mentioned previously, as well as VEGF, 
And so those two genes are important for growth. And, you know, we essentially confirmed that previous Urbizu study. So what do these findings tell us about Chiari? First, that there are multiple genes that appear to contribute to Chiari malformation. And it looks like that some families have some variants in some genes and some families have variants in other genes. So there's not one single gene that seems to be important for everyone. We found that many of these genes are involved in bone and connective tissue growth. So, you know, this suggests that even though the symptoms that patients experience tend to be neurologic in nature, that probably the mechanisms that lead to Curie malformation really involve bone and connective tissue growth. There also do seem to be different genes that are associated with the connective tissue disorder positive families versus the connective tissue disorder negative families. And so again, what we see clinically, you know, is giving us some important clues. And finally, especially based on that more recent Sadler study, this suggests that there are different genes that are likely involved with pediatric onset curie compared with adolescent and adult onset curie. And so based on all this information, where do we go from here? What are the next steps? The first, I think, is to more carefully examine this connection that, that we feel we do see between connective tissue disorders and Chiari. We need to sequence a lot more Chiari cases in families, both with pediatric and adult onset, because as I said, there seem to be a lot of genes and there seem to be different genes depending on pediatric versus adult onset. And then as we find these genes, we really need to start doing some careful biology to figure out how is it that these genes and these variants in these genes are causing Chiari. And then finally, I think something that's particularly helpful and useful to patients and families is for us to start determining if genetic testing really will help us identify the patients who are the best surgical candidates for a decompression surgery versus maybe cervical stabilization surgery. And so with that, I will just thank all my colleagues that worked with me on many of the studies that I talked about. And I'd certainly like to thank Conquer Chiari for the opportunity to speak with you today.